about 10 days ago, it was the Thursday before um, Father Sean preached, um, he, he came into my office and he's like, do you have an idea what you're going to be preaching on on the 21st? And I said, well, yeah, I have an idea. And he's like, cool, let me tell you my idea that I'm going to preach on on Sunday. And so we did. And I said, well, this is what I'm preaching on. And we both looked at each other and were like, huh, we're opposite sides of the same coin, aren't we? Front and back. And we were like, yeah. So uh, if you were here last week, uh, and if you weren't, uh, you will hear some familiarity in what I'm about to say. So uh, Mark's gospel, uh, the sixth chapter, and if you will, uh, if you will uh, hold a... Uh, Hold a posture of reverence in your heart as we hear the gospel of the Lord this morning. It says, the apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to the land at Gennesaret and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. This is the gospel of the Lord this morning. Yeah. So he talked about, Father Sean talked about Sabbath last week, and if you didn't listen to the sermon, go back and listen to it. It's, it's worth a listen. Uh, I sat through it both services, um, and I was just totally, uh, totally amazed by what he had to, had to say. And it was really powerful both times. And his key passage was Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now, one of the things that uh, I find is really good when you're looking at scripture is uh, to look at the context of what's being said. You know, part of the issue of just pulling out a verse to use can be that you're not entirely sure what the context is until you've studied it. So context is important. Um, when I was studying Hebrew in undergrad, uh, the thing with the Hebrew language is one word can actually have four meanings and you determine the, the translation, the meaning by the context of what's being said around it. So the, the running joke when you study Hebrew is it's all based upon the context. So within this, it's important to understand the context of what Jesus is saying. So if we back up to Matthew eleven twenty five, Jesus says this. We'll get a running start. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Children can say amazing things, right? Children can, can produce truths that catch our attention. Verse 26, even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight, all things have been delivered to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and the one whom the Son wills to reveal him. Next verse. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So Jesus says in 1127, the Father is revealed to me and to all those who I want to know about him, and then turns around and says, come to me. That makes me think that this is a call for everyone. Amen. Keep that in mind. So as we continue from that point where Pastor Sean left off last week, uh, he mentioned that immediately following um, in Matthew 12 that Jesus talks about Sabbath. He's confronted about the Sabbath. He teaches on the Sabbath, the importance of Sabbath. I'll just say the word one more time so you get it, Sabbath. Uh, if Pastor Sean were here, he would do that too. Um, he heals people. He goes out and he heals people. They bring people to him and he heals people. And then there's a series of parables. If you've never paused to read the parables of Christ, I highly recommend that you do it. Because there's, it's, it's not just pretty little stories that look good when you do an illustration and hang it on a wall. There's a lot that's in there for us to understand and for us to unpack, even in such short teachings. And Christ always was good about trying to put it in the context of the people that he was speaking to. 
one of the things that we try and do around here is make people understand that there's a context to doing ministry. We don't do contact or we don't do ministry in a vacuum. Ministry happens everywhere, all places and all times. So now let's approach the on-ramp for this week's passage. So, so stick with me here. So when we look at the first three books of the New Testament, the th first three gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they are what are known as synoptic gospels. Synoptic is a couple of words together. Uh, syn is where you get the S-Y-N, not S-I-N. Uh, S-Y-N is you get the word like synthesizer or synthesis, something along those lines. And it means like to, to come together, to bring together, to be able to, to put uh, in proximity. Optic view, you know, people use the term optics nowadays. I'm just like, Optics? You're going to check my eyes with that or something? Is that what's going on? So optics of having, having a view. So it's the same view. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all telling similar stories and telling them in a similar way, but just their, their own spin on it, their own perspective. Heather and I could see the same thing, but she's going to tell it one way and I'm going to tell it another, the gospel according to Heather. Um, you know, and, and, and that will be slightly different than maybe Matthew, Mark, or Luke. And <laughs> but in, in Matthew... <laughs> And Matthew, thir man, I didn't expect, okay. Um, in Matthew 13, 53 through uh, 14, 12, uh, it has the same stories there as the beginning of Mark chapter 6. And that is, first off, Jesus is rejected in his hometown. It's where we hear Jesus talk about a prophet does not have honor within his hometown. And, and the people there all get upset with him. Some even get offended by him and, and you know, reject him, cast him away from there. And the second is when his cousin, John the Baptist, is put to death. So John, if, if you remember, John was hanging out on the backside of the desert, the area over the Jordan River, this group of people called the Essenes um, in this area that we call Qumran. If you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, these were the guys who wrote that. And they were basically like Jewish monastics, okay? And John learned about baptism and what that means from them. John upset somebody. And he gets thrown in jail, and John starts to have concerns, sends word to Jesus, and ultimately, uh, if you follow the, the scripture there, you, you learn that John does end up dying. He's, he's beheaded. And so within just a short period of time, Jesus goes from this rejection from his hometown to his cousin is put to death. As you, as you chase a little bit further, the next couple of bits of scripture, again in Matthew and Mark, and you notice, uh, for those of you who maybe track, who were tracking with me as I was reading, there was a gap. There was a big old gap in what I in what I read because that's the reading that was appointed for today. But in that gap, Jesus feeds the five thousand and he walks on water. Okay. So woven in the midst of these two accounts, uh, from Mark's perspective, are two small stories. And the first one happens um, in Mark six six, and that is that Jesus calls his twelve uh, apostles to him the 12 that he chose, and he sends them out two by two. So one of my, one of my mentors when I was in my first couple of years of college, um, his name's Larry Anderson, great guy, um, just retired from teaching after 30 some odd years. And he would always tell his ministry students that if you're gonna go out and do ministry, always go with somebody. Always have a teammate. And don't go out and try and do this by yourself. You can't do this by yourself that you should always have somebody that you go with. Not that you two are going to like pastor a church together, but you've got to do this endeavor together. He's like, now some people are fortunate enough to do that, but nobody's a lone ranger. Everybody's got to have somebody. I mean, you know, it's, it, it's the gospel according to Bill Withers. We all need somebody to lean on. You know, there, <laughs> I knew I could drop something like that in there this morning. That was nice. I did not have that planned. It is nowhere in those notes. <clears throat> I teach musicology, by the way. That's like my other, my other gig is I teach musicology. So there's a lot of music and lyrics and stuff just here. I'm not always sure what's gonna, what the Holy Spirit's going to pull out in the moment. It could be a worship song. It could be 90s alternative rock. It could be Bill Withers. I don't know. We, ju we just follow the Holy Spirit and we get there. And the second thing is, and this is where we tie into... Um, Pastor Sean's message from last week is Jesus telling the apostles in Mark 6, 31, come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. So in Mark 6, 30, um, we're told that the apostles gathered to Jesus and told him all things, both what they had done and taught. So this is, this is a reunion moment. I don't know that we're actually told in the gospel narrative how long they were gone when Jesus sent them out, but they come back and they're full of stories. 
Like they've seen all this stuff happening. Um, they've, they've experienced all that. Maybe, maybe you've had this situation happen where like a friend, uh, a family member, a spouse, a kid comes back from a trip, a camp or something, and they, they come back and they're just like live wire. You know, from the time that they get off the plane or that you pick them up all the way home and then all the way from, from there. I was telling first service many years ago, my, my younger sister, Lacey, she did a missions trip uh, to London and then into Russia for about two, three weeks. And she and one of her friends uh, went and did the trip. They flew back into Kansas City. And uh, we were the only ones who were available to give them a ride at the time. So Allie and I drove, drove up to Kansas City. We picked them up. And then we took them to Manhattan because they were going to K-State at the time. And all the way from Kansas City to Manhattan, Lacey and her friend were just like, just back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, just chattering, just telling us every, every blooming detail. And we get to Manhattan. And they're just still going. And they're just still going for like another half hour in the car, just still going. And we're like, girls. It's, I mean, by that time, it was like, it was like nine o'clock when we picked them up in Kansas City. It's, you know, we're pushing midnight here, ladies. We gotta, we gotta go. And they get in the house and they're just, da, 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 da. heads hit the pillow. It's off. <laughs> it's off. But the apostles come back from this, you know, from this great moment. And they're just, they're just full of testimony. They just want to tell Jesus everything that happened and everything that they saw and the people that got healed and everything. And Jesus, in the midst of all of this, says, this is wonderful, and this is beautiful, and this, we need to rejoice in this moment. We're going to put a pin in this, and we're going to come back to it, because I need you to come away to a quiet place and rest. Because you remember, if you go through and you study scripture, that Jesus himself would go away, even in the midst of everything that was going on, to a quiet place and to rest. Because the scripture says they didn't even have time to eat Here we have Jesus recognizing the fact the apostles have been so busy. They've been doing so many things. And it's all been good things. It's all been good things. They've been preaching the gospel. They've been healing people. And they haven't had time to eat. Does this sound familiar in anybody else's life? Or am I just reading my own mail this morning? Yeah? Okay. Just want to make sure. Jesus sought solitude. Later on in Mark 6, um, we'll hear that, well, out of Matthew's account, we'll hear that he departs to this mountain to go and pray. Now, normally we wouldn't think of a deserted place as restful, unless you happen to like the desert. Not a lot of people do, but in case you don't, um, not a lot of people would see the desert as restful. They would see it as a place where there's no food, there's no water, and there's probably nobody there, like no humans at least. There might be the, the odd animal or something like that, but there's nothing there. Yet another translation of the same passage calls it a secluded place, a secluded place. So think of Jesus' statement from that perspective. Come by yourselves away from the crowd to a secluded place and rest for a while. And I can get behind that, a secluded place, something that's, that's a little bit away. And verse 32 then says that they got in the boat and they headed to that place. And I started thinking as I was reading through this this week, I wonder what happened when they got on the boat. You think they just kept going? You think they were like all up next to Jesus? Jesus, okay, now continuing my story, this is what happened. Or they like started to pair off and do that. I wonder if somebody actually found like a corner of the boat and like put a towel over their face or something like that and just like put their feet up and actually like chilled for a little bit. I wonder if any of them actually thought that that moment on the boat was the secluded place. Was that coming away with Christ? Because remember what Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty nine, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, and you will find rest for your souls. So the 12 had already done what Jesus had done. They'd followed the instructions that he gave them when he sent them out. They went and healed. They went and preached the gospel. That's how they'd learned from him. And now they were finding rest for their souls. So they arrive on the shore of this secluded place, and what do they see? A tranquil oasis that's just like teeming with life and and ready for them just to put the feet up? No. They see a horde of people, a crush of people there waiting for them. Uh, Mark 6.33 says, The multitude saw them departing, and many knew him, and they ran there on foot from all the cities, and they arrived before they came together. Now, this lake that they're talking about, it's not a huge lake. You know, I think it's bigger than Marion. It's probably bigger than Canopolis. But the fact that they saw them leaving and they go around the edge of the lake 
It's kind of like they, they had an idea where they were going to go. And it wasn't just the people who were there when they were shoving off. No, they kept grabbing people as they go. They kept telling people about this saying, hey, you need to come along. The Jesus, he's coming. You know, we got to get there and, and all his people with him. And this is going to be a great moment. And the scripture says that they were waiting when they got there. Now, this might have surprised or even disappointed the apostles, but it didn't do that to Jesus. Verse 34 says, when he got out of the boat, that he looked with the people and he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep not having a shepherd and then began to teach them. Like we said earlier, Mark, uh, excuse me, Matthew eleven twenty seven. the father is revealed to me, Jesus said, and all those I want to know about him. And then Jesus said, come to me, you who are labored and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus made it clear this is for everyone. And the crowds that heard Jesus on that day took him at his word. They took him at his word. They were desirous of that rest. They were desirous of that lessening of their burden. They were ready to have fewer difficulties. Does this hit home with anybody? I am ready for this. I'm, I'm saying I as in me. I am ready for this. So what about the apostles in that moment? How do you think they took it? How do you think they responded? They probably, I mean, they might have grumbled. They might have, <sighs> through gritted teeth, I probably would have. I had my mind set. We were heading to that secluded spot, and I was going to get away from everybody. I've got to imagine there was at least one introvert in the 12. And he was ready. He was ready for that moment. He was going to get away from everyone. And he was going to find himself a corner of that oasis. And, and you know, he was going to have some, some time. Jesus told him to come aside to this secluded place. And now this. Uh, the writer, uh, Henri Nouwen, he was talking about finding silence in prayer. Or trying to. And this is what he wrote. Why should I spend an hour in prayer when I do nothing during that time but think about people I'm angry with or people who are angry with me or the books that I should read or the books I should be writing and thousands of other silly things that happen to grab my mind at the moment? The answer is because God is greater than my mind and than my heart and what is really happening in the house of prayer is not measurable in terms of human success or failure. What I must do, first of all, is be faithful. What I must do, first of all, is be faithful. It's in the faithfulness that we find this. And the apostles had been faithful to do what Jesus asked them. They went out two by two. This was the training wheels were off. He sent them out. He sent them away from home. He sent them with a buddy, buddy system. They went out. And he gave them the authority. And they experienced that authority in, Mar in the first part of Mark 6. Now they would get to experience Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now they would learn how to tend the sheep from the good shepherd himself. Mark 6, 34. Jesus has compassion on them. The word there means that he's moved in his inmost parts, in his gut. It moved him to his core. One commentator wrote this, because the people were as sheep, not having a shepherd, Christ observed that they were hungering and thirsting after the word of righteousness. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be, one more time, filled, thank you. Uh, again, teacher, I will wait for the answer. I have nothing but time. Unlike my classroom, I am not bound to 50 minutes, whatever you might think. And they had no faithful spiritual pastors to feed them and with knowledge and understanding. For the scribes and the Pharisees who were supposed to be the religious leaders of the day were blind guides and shepherds that could not understand so that the people were ready to perish for lack of knowledge. Old Testament, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Not having any spiritual comfort and refreshment under the ministry of the scribes and Pharisees. So they followed Christ wherever he went with great zeal and fervency, fervency, earnestly desiring the bread of life. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever eats and drinks of me, though he die, yet shall he live. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. The people heard this, it hit them in the heart, and they knew that wherever Jesus went, 
they had to go, even if it meant that they were dragging everybody with them. They had to walk around the lake. They had to take that and get there. And now the apostles find themselves in a moment, and they have a decision to make. Are they going to get offended, or are they going to rest in Jesus? How are they going to choose this moment? Because in this moment, they have to understand, and we can see this from the outside, it wasn't just the people who were ministering there were the ones being ministered to. It was the 12 who were being ministered to as well. Their own salvation was being worked out in that moment. The Greek word there is theosis. And this idea of theosis means that I was saved in a moment of time because we live in time. My watch is telling me that we live in time. I am being saved in this present moment, and I will be continued to be saved and ever transformed into the image and likeness of Christ. That's an understanding of theosis. And the apostles have a decision to make in that moment. And they decide, even though they're kind of thrown into the scrum, as it were, they decide to get stuck in and be in that moment. One writer uh, I, I have just recently learned about to, uh, through some of their preachings and teachings said this. When you're, when you're faced with people who are causing a challenging moment, don't say that person bothers me. Think instead, that person sanctifies me. You can think of it as kind of a holy bless their hearts. <laughs> Just look at a person and say, you know what? You sanctify me. <laughs> Parents, you can use that one on your kids. Just look at them and say, you sanctify me right now. You're sanctifying me so much right now. You better praise God for how much you're sanctifying me in this moment. Oh. <laughs> mm. You can laugh in church, it's okay. So they had come to Christ, they'd gotten in the boat, expecting, I'm, I'm guessing, uh, to have had this extended break away from people, and now they, like all of us, are faced with this choice. They can either turn tail and run, or they can stay and rest in the presence of Emmanuel, God with us. Um, another favorite author, author around the house here, uh, Brennan Manning, if you know Brennan's writings, he wrote this in uh, his book, uh, Ruthless Trust. He said, against insurmountable obstacles and without a clue as to the outcome, the trusting heart says, Abba, I surrender my will and my life to you without any reservation and with boundless confidence, for you are my loving father. That sounds pretty good, right? But for a lot of people, it sounds like it's just out of reach. Like, you're getting your fingernails on that, you know, and you can't. So here's what, here's what Nowen said earlier, uh, who we heard from earlier, says about seclusion. We say to each other that we need some solitude in our lives. What we're really thinking about is we need a time and a place by ourselves where we're not bothered with people. We can think our own thoughts, express our own complaints, and do our own thing, whatever it may be. For us, solitude means privacy. We think of it kind of like, kind of like a station where we can recharge our batteries, or you know, think about uh, a boxer when they're in the corner and they're they're getting some water and they're getting, you know, the speech. You know, for those of you who know Rocky, you can think of you can think of Rocky, um, that sort of a thing. In short, we think it as a place where we can gather new strength and continue the ongoing competition of life. But here's the deal: that's not the solitude in in the deserted place that Moses experienced. That's not what John the Baptist experienced. That's not what the early Christians who ran to the desert experienced. They didn't go to that place to get away from the world. They ran to the desert to experience God, Amen. to encounter God in the deserted place, in the secluded place. Now it says, for them, so, uh, solitude is not a private therapeutic place. Rather, it is a place of conversion, the place where the old self dies and the new self is born, the place where the emergence of the new man and new woman occurs. The, desert, the, the, the deserted place, the secluded place, is that place where all the other stuff of life gets cast off, and we run to the one who can make the difference in our lives. So the apostles found themselves in that secluded place, in their place of solitude, in their place of conversion. And that place was right beside the one who called them, the one who sent them out, the one who gathered them back, and the one who brought them to that moment. They thought they were going to a desert to get away from people. In the ancient church, they have this concept of pustinia, which is 
literally means desert. And it is you go intentionally into a deserted place, uninhibited, to meet with the one who created you. To meet with God. Even the, the old, old mothers and fathers would say to meet with God face to face. So the apostles make their choice and they experience the grace of God. They experience the grace of the good shepherd. So that's where this gospel reading ends. But the moment's not over. So I mentioned earlier that out of the, the systematic readings that we use typically around here, um, the lectionary, this was the gospel reading for today. But in another lectionary that's used in a different tradition within Christianity, the lectionary reading is actually Matthew 14, which is our gap in our reading. Matthew 14 and verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret. Three times in the course of the readings that we heard between what Pastor Sean preached last week and today, we hear Jesus say, Come. In Matthew eleven twenty eight, he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In Mark 6.31, he says, come by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. And here in Matthew 14.29, he simply says one word, come. Or you can think of it like this if you like. Come to me when you're struggling hard and carrying heavy loads. I don't care how big your struggle bucket is. Come to me when it seems like you can't tell if you're coming or going. Come to me when a storm is literally raging around you. And we can think, well, okay, what do I do with all this? And thankfully, some people who've gone before us in the faith have offered us their thoughts on a lot of this. Here's a few of my favorites and some that I've been enjoying for a while. One said, do you think that he who numbers the hairs of your head does not know the measure of your suffering? Yes, he knows it. Therefore, be at rest, trusting in our Heavenly Father. This next one is one of my absolute favorites. It's been probably one of my main focuses of the past year to 18 months. And I by no means have this finished. The, this is theosis. This will take my life to accomplish this. Acquire a spirit of peace and thousands around you will be saved. This salvation is not just for me. It's for you. Your salvation is not just for you. It's for the person next to you. It's for the person at the restaurant. It's for the person that you're going to encounter when you get called at the 11th hour to go do the funeral of their mother the next day. True story, it happened to us this week. And all the people who were there. And that domino effect just keeps going and going and going. This is one of my favorites, and this actually comes from a guy who lived in the area where Allie and I lived in in England. And uh, he's buried in the, ch in the big cathedral there, uh, right next to my building uh, at the university. Uh, we, we do a lot with boats in the UK, uh, so there's a lot of sailing. So this is from St. Bede. He says, unfurl the sails and let God steer us where he will. Some of us are just so, some of us get so frightened that we, we don't want to risk anything. But the, but the fact of the matter is that if you keep those sails rolled up, you're at the mercy, the absolute mercy. You can't catch the wind at all. And think about this in Hebrew and in Greek, the word for wind is the same word for spirit. So St. Bede says, unfurl those sails 
and let the Spirit of God take us where he wills, not where we will. So through this, again, think big picture and funnel down. Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29, come to me all you. All means all, everybody. When he says it in Mark 6, he's looking at his apostles, he's looking at his inner circle, and he says, come, come, get away, come. But then he looks at one, he looks at Peter, and he says, come. I was, I was struck when we, were, um, when we were singing Same God earlier. So I've got this cross that I've had for eight years, and on the front side, it's, uh, it's Jesus crucified. And while we were standing there worshiping, the Holy Spirit reminded me what's on the back side. It's St. Peter. It's Peter himself. And in that moment, Jesus said to me, you need to come with whatever you're facing, son. And you need to lay it down before me. Like I said, just because we're the people who stand up here doesn't mean we've got everything figured out. It is a process. And it's not something that we do on our own. And it's not something that we just tried to conjure up one day when we were bored. There's a wonderful little book called The Practice of the Presence of God, uh, written by a guy named Brother Lawrence. I'm seeing some heads nodding, so I, I, I get that some people have, have read it. Uh, it, was in, it was a series of his letters that he wrote to friends. It was never intended to be published, but you know how some people are. They keep the letters and they hold on to it, and sometimes they do things like that with it. And so he was reflecting on 1 Corinthians 13, and he wrote this. All things are possible to him who believes. They are less difficult to him who hopes. They are more easy to him who loves, and still more easy to him who perseveres in the practice of all three of these, faith, hope, and love. So to, to go to God, and that's, again, I love, it. I love it when a plan comes together. Yes, that's an A-team reference. Um, I, lo I love it when a plan comes together when I, and like this isn't some kind of magic show this doesn't, it doesn't always roll like this, but it happens a lot, which is really neat. I didn't know what the songs were until after I'd pretty much already finished my sermon. And so to, to hear, hear what songs we were going to be doing and to see and to know the, the context of that, that we were going to sing uh, like Same God or Getting Ready, and to, to hold up that idea of God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness in the midst of all of this, was just, uh, was just beautiful. So to go to God asks us to believe, to believe that he can work in the midst of our struggles and lift burdens. Might I suggest that we live in a world today, even within our Christian faith, that some people wonder if God can actually do anything. It's an honest question. It would not surprise me if you pulled a bunch of people coming out of churches today, if they would believe that God could do anything, if they believe that God could heal, if they would believe that God could restore a relationship, if they would believe that God would provide, if they even believe that God loved them. I bet we would be stunned at the number of Christians who do not believe that God can love them because of what they've done and who they are. I'll tell you who you are. You're one made in the image and likeness of God. You are his child. That's who you are. That's who you are. So we go to God in our belief. Even, even, the, even the man whose son was demon-possessed, Lord, I believe, help my what? Unbelief. It's a, didn't we just read? Peter says, Jesus, if it's truly you, call me out. And Jesus didn't give him this whole list of reasons why it was him. He said one word, come. That's all it took. To go to God asks us to have hope. Now, this is not blow out a candle and make a wish. This is not pull the, the arm on the holy slot machine. So I'm just saying. This is a longing. This is a yearning. One ancient definition of the word hope ties it to the word trust. And as the songwriter told us, tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, 
just to take him at his word. Even that song says, how, Jesus, Jesus, how I trust thee, how I've proved you over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. All the grace to love him more. To go to God asks us to love. To love him with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves. One 20th century writer, a um, guy by the name of Paisios, um, who lived in Greece, said this, where love is, there is Christ, love himself. And where humility exists, the grace of God takes up permanent residence. God reigns, and the earth is ultimately transformed into paradise. Humility and love, there you have it. This is everything. Humility and love. Can I suggest that coming to God, even after he said it, takes a certain level of humility on your part? Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. I said it when we were singing the line out of uh, Second Chronicles. If my people who are called by thy, my name will listen, not just hearing. I tell my music appreciation students, there's a difference between hearing and listening. You parents have told your children this too. You're not listening to me. You're not paying attention. If they will listen, and if they will turn, and if they will call, then I will hear, and I will answer them. For I am their God, and they are my people. So as, as I bring this to a, a close, I tell, I tell my students I don't put periods at the end of my lectures. I put semicolons, because you never, you never truly finish. You never truly finish it. So Jesus calls us to come today. Now, this, this isn't just about a salvation, come to the altar, give your life to Christ. If you need to do that, let's do that. I mean, let's, have, let's do that. Right. But that's not, that's not the only thing that's at stake this morning. And I don't use that word haphazardly because there's some stuff at stake this morning. Some of us need to come because we're struggling hard and carrying the loads. I don't need anybody to raise their hand because I know what I'm dealing with this morning. And some of us need to bring that struggle and that load. And I'm, I'm gonna tell you, that table is a perfect place to do it. So as I offer my next couple points, I want you to start preparing your hearts and minds and just listening to the Holy Spirit as he prepares us to encounter him at the table. Some of us need to come because we're struggling hard and carrying heavy loads. Some of us need to come unto Christ for that place of conversion. For some of us, it's salvation. But for others of us, it is that place, not only where the new self dies and the old self is born, but it's the place of the emergence of the new man. Again, God's mercies are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. I am not the same man that I was yesterday. And I will not be, by the grace of God, the same man tomorrow that I am today. I will emerge as a new person. And some of us need that moment. It may be in just one sliver of your life, whatever that is. If that's what you need to hear the call of Christ to come to, then you come for that. And I'm not just talking about this moment at the end of second service on the 21st of July in 2024. I'm talking about tonight. I'm talking about tomorrow morning. I'm talking about Thursday afternoon at 3.55 p.m talking about that and some of us need to come for healing and it's not just a physical healing but there might be stuff that you're dealing with and some of us need to come for healing of that and it's for nourishment as we go along the journey that's why that's why going to church being in fellowship with other believers receiving the sacraments of the church such as, as the eucharist that's why this is important because it's nourishment for the journey it's what we need to get us from this moment to that moment where we enter into the presence of god for eternity it's not holding it all to the last moment. Look, I stood by a stranger's graveside on Tuesday. Kurt and Kathy and I did. And we eulogized a woman we never knew. I have a picture that big of this lady. But can I tell you that from the testimony of her family and from the simple fact that she was a daughter of the, of the King of Glory, 
that she was working towards the same thing that we're all working towards, to ever be transformed into the image and likeness of God. And that moment, that's what her family was also working towards. And it was one of the coolest, it was one of the coolest funerals I've ever been to. It was such a blessing to do, and, and God revealed a lot of stuff in a short period of time because of the faithfulness of people to gather together. So we come this morning carrying those loads, coming for a place of conversion and emergence of God, and coming forward for that healing and that nourishment that we need, regardless of what you, and I'm not trying to put anything on anybody. Don't hear me trying to impose something on you. This is, this is not, I'm trying to guilt you into anything. That's not this. I don't do that. That's not honorable. I'm simply saying, if that's you, when you come forward to receive this morning, hold that to God. Hold it up to him. Open hands like this. You don't have to physically do it, but think of your heart. Open like that, not holding on to it. It doesn't matter if it's your money or if it's your heart. If you're tight-fisted like that, you can receive nothing. If Heather tried to give me something right now, holding my hands, I couldn't accept it because my hands are clenched like that. But if I have my hands open to receive... I let God do whatever he's going to do, and I can receive from God whatever he has for me. And here's a hint. It might look different for you than it does for the person across the, the sanctuary. Your spouse, your kid, it might look different. Your mileage may vary. And that's a good thing. So regardless, all of us need to come in belief, with hope, and in love that God is going to do something in our lives this morning. Amen. If you're able, um, I would invite you to stand with me as we go before the table of the Lord this morning.